Hello and welcome to the e-learning session on spectroscopy from Curenceline. Spectroscopy is a bit of a strange word, but it literally means measurement with light. That's all. The good news is you can use the analyzers from Curenceline perfectly without understanding the following video, but you might just be curious. The video has been subdivided into two subjects. This first video will be on the basics of spectroscopy, not at a scientific level, but more or less to say, sort of an introduction. In video part two, I will dig further into uh, the near infrared part of the spectroscopy, because a lot of the analyzers from Kunzlein are based on near infrared spectroscopy on near. So stick around and have fun. Okay. So the first thing when we work with spectroscopy is to study light. Light in this sense should be seen very broadly as electromagnetic radiation. Some of this light we can see, some of this light we do not see. The light we have always known as light was the visible light. The visible light which sits in the middle of this electromagnetic uh, spectrum of radiation where we have the red colors, in the middle, we have the green, and towards the higher energies, we have the blue colors. That's how we always saw light. We have to free our mind a little bit because around the year 1800, Mr. Herschel discovered that we had also heat radiation. It was a mishap of an experiment that went uh, uh, to give us insight into the fact that we had an infrared. Infra means under, so it's under the red in terms of energy. And likewise, we have ultraviolet, ultra meaning above violet, and we have the violet at the far end, the high energetic part of the visible spectrum. So that's where we are in terms of an overall understanding of light is it's an electromagnetic radiation. Such radiation travels very fast. And like normal, light, if we dare to say normally here, uh, light in general, electromagnetic uh, wave moves very, very fast. 300,000 kilometers per second, that equals around seven and a half times around the entire world in just one second. We distinguish between these various types of, uh, of light with their wavelength, and the energy associated with these waves. The shorter the waves, the higher energy we have in the light. Hence, we can do different things with a big hammer and a small hammer. We can study different things, and all these areas are uh, used in some ways. Visible lights, normal photography, videos like this. The ultraviolet we can, uh, we can use for specific electrons uh, and, and chemicals. Uh, Mr. Röntgen, uh, X-ray uh, is, is used for see if we have broken a, an arm and gamma radiation is the bad stuff that will really destroy us. If we go lower in energy, higher in wavelength, we will get to radar, television and radio and the sorts. But they are all just merely light, electromagnetic radiation with various uh, wavelength. So the short thing we just have to take with us from this uh, short uh, one slide introduction is that light is progressing energy in a waveform. Think of it as radiated energy. That will help us when we get uh, to use it in a minute to study matter. In the spectroscopy uh, of our primary focus today is the infrared spectroscopy. That means, like we told, I told you a minute ago, that the visible light sits over here and we are infrared. We are lower in energy than red light. The infrared region is a fairly large region, stretches over decades of wavelength. But we tend to subdivide it. So I will use sometimes uh, new words and I just want to introduce them at this point. We typically subdivide the infrared region into three subregions: the near region, the mid region, and the far. These are all references to the good old, well-known visible light. 
So the infrared region that sits very close to the visible near is called near infrared. Near visible infrared. It's just become infrared. We have the mid infrared region, normally referred to as FTIR. That region is where the molecules vibrate. I'll refer to that later. We are in the 10 to the 14th hertz vibrations per second, so it's not something we can see. But these are the fundamental regions. If we are to study very low energy things, like in a crystal, we will use the far, far away from the visible region. It's called far infrared. So these are a couple of words that this is quite often referred to just as near. This is quite often called IR, not to be confused with the overall region name. And this is called fear or fine fret. So abbreviations are in any, uh, in any of these technical languages. And when I talk about near, near infrared, we will talk about that little tiny region sitting close to the visible, but very useful. So now we understand light, light being progressing energy. This light will have to meet matter, stuff, products. And how is that constructed? Well, for some of you, this is basic. For some of you, it might be new. But let's start at the very beginning. We have atoms. Atoms is made of protons. And around that, we have electrons. If we only have one proton and one electron, we call it hydrogen. If we get to have more protons, uh, we are likely also to have some neutrons. And around that, two electrons. Now we have created helium with a mass of four, but an atomic number of two. So that's a very short introduction to atoms. We will not rest further on that. We will uh, with further ado, we'll go to look at um, molecules. So once we have accepted that we have atoms, we may start to look into molecules. Molecules, if we take an oxygen and we take some hydrogen, hydrogen atoms, oxygen atoms, but now with chemical bonds between these, we can form molecules. In this, we have constructed a water molecule. I have drawn up the connection as springs because that's quite convenient to look at it as a, an interacting force, so to speak, like a spring. Because these uh, springs will, like any other mass, where we have a mass, a mass and a spring, vibrate. These uh, atoms will vibrate, these molecules will vibrate at very high frequencies, frequencies that matches the infrared. It's actually quite simple to calculate. One might think that it took a gigantic model, but a little bit like if we had a mass hanging from somewhere, we would calculate, if I pull this one, the harmonic oscillator, we could calculate the frequency with a formula and the square root of the uh, mass over the uh, constant. So in this way, having uh, this quite simple formula, we can calculate the vibrations. It's as simple as that. It's all quite simple when we look at water. But what about if we look at other large molecules like proteins and lipids. It becomes a lot more complicated and a lot more vibrations will be visible. But it's the, the fundamental principles are still the same. When it comes to these vibrations, vibrations, um, if we look at this one, might simply stretch out this way. So we have stretching of the molecule we could also see bending of the molecule. And we could even see that these guys would rotate. 
The rotational forces are typically weaker than the bending or the stretching. These stretching and bendings can be symmetrical and asymmetrical. And in this way, we get a lot of motion in the molecule and it all happens at the same time. The rate of vibration here is 10 to the 14th hertz, meaning millions and millions of cycles per second. But the good news is it's uh, completely unique to this molecule. Only a water molecule will have exactly these masses and these springs, so the frequency for this kind of motion will be different from any other. So by looking at a spectrum in which we get to see all these things, we can learn a lot about the molecules by studying their vibrations. Infrared spectroscopy is about looking at molecular vibrations, telling us something about what's there, how much of it. For a molecule to be able to absorb light, it requires interaction with the infrared light. Try to think of it in this way. If we have this stretching going on at some frequency, and this corresponds to a certain wavelength in the infrared, they will interact. They will interact because we have created here a small modulated field. We know that hydrogen is positively charged, and we know that oxygen is negatively charged. And in this way, we have created here what we call a dipole. Only molecules creating a dipole will absorb infrared light. This also means that any organic uh, matter, any functional group will absorb, have its own frequency. On the other hand, it also means that there are things not absorbing infrared because they cannot create a dipole. That would go for oxygen. Helium, hydrogen, because these are symmetrical in terms of charge and will not displace any charge out of the homogeneous plan. They will not work with infrared, but there are millions, millions of organic things that will, and all the normal stuff looked at in infrared and near infrared will absorb plenty. Okay, so infrared spectroscopy deals about letting light and matter meet. Typically, we have a light source. The light reaches the sample, either in transmission or reflection. Some of it will be absorbed by the molecules uh, met along the road, which will absorb infrared, and the leftover reaches the detector. By subtracting the two, we have now created a spectrum. If we look at this uh, spectrum of edible oil, we see that we have a lot of peaks and bounces. In this case, it's a mid-infrared spectrum of vegetable oil. The x-axis contain the frequency and the y-axis the absorbance, how much light was absorbed along the road. We see that there are specific uh, small uh, peaks in the fingerprint region. We also see that we have CH and OH regions. So where the peak is will tell us what kind of a vibration it is and how high it is, how much of that specific vibration was present. We see that all peaks are not at the same height. It means some of these antennas are stronger than the others. So the absolute height cannot be used by, for anything we have to calibrate, especially if we have mixtures of uh, various products, uh, fat, moisture, protein, we will have to calibrate towards a reference method because 50% of protein and 50% of fat will not give us the same uh, height of peaks. So the absolute height means nothing, but still very useful because where the peak is tells us this is fat, and another place, this is protein. And there are large tables to look into to see where will you find your molecule. We can see a little bit more than that because we can also see the temperature of the sample because 
the hotter it gets, the more it vibrates. So we will see small shifts to higher frequencies. If there is salts present with um, irons like potassium or chloride, we will see that they will move these antennas slightly out of balance. So we can see a lot about the environment of the uh, molecules as well as the amount after calibration. Very useful. So how can we use all this? Well, both mid-infrared, near-infrared, and any other sort of spectroscopy has a vast bunch of applications. The mid-infrared is primarily used for gas phase work or very detailed study of molecules, whereas the near-infrared has become a widely, widely used tool for QC. Uh, it's slightly easier to work with. I'll show you that in video number two. So in conclusion for part one, we have looked at light, we have looked at matter, we have looked at how matter and atoms can form molecules, that molecules vibrate, and that these vibrations can interact with infrared uh, region light and create absorption. And that absorption in reality turns into a spectrum, and that the spectrum can tell us what is there and how much after calibration. So generally speaking, a very interesting region in terms of spectroscopy, very useful for a large bunch of applications. I hope to see you in video number two. Thank you for now.